Some of you might not know, but back in 2012, I embarked on what became my most infamous project car. I wanted to build an electric hot rod. Bearing in mind, back then, Tesla was not a mainstream name. Formula E did not exist. But I'd seen a few people experimenting with electric converted classics and trying to push the boundary, so I thought I'd try and push the EV envelope myself. Wanted to see how much performance you could get out of it and whether you could do something charismatic to convince people that EVs really were the future. This is what I built the Enfield 8000 flux capacitor. I'm going to use in this video, I'm going to use a lot of unseen footage and photos that's never been put out there before to tell the story of how I built this, why I built it, what it felt like to drive, the highs and probably the lows. I'm Johnny Smith, aka Car Pervert, and this is The Late Break Show. Okay, so how did I end up with the world's quickest street legal electric car. Well, it all started with me tr wanting to build an electric street legal hot rod. I wanted to kind of use the ethos of hot rodding from back in the 50s when you took a 30s car or you know, a 40s car that was largely um, worthless and put lots of power into it, and then start to make it look interesting. You're probably wondering why I'm gonna build this car. Well, that's a really good question. I don't really know why I'm gonna build it. I think I want to do a fast electric car because I like drag racing. I always have been fascinated with drag racing, but crucially, I think that it's a good time to do an electric car. A lot of people are building them now, big manufacturers, and they seem to be um, on the road to success and mainstream uh, consumerism. Whereas before they were always a bit left field, a bit odd, um, the black sheep of the family really. Why the Enfield? Because hardly anyone seems to know about it. And it is an electric car. It was an electric car from new. And I like the idea of taking an electric car that was always born and designed to be lecky and bringing it slap bang into the 21st century using all the technology that we have now that we didn't have back in the early 70s when the Enfield was conceived. I had to decide what car I was going to do, and I knew I didn't really want to convert a piston car to electric, which would have been easier and is the more common route. So I started to pick up books and research like what cars had come and gone and been lost in the tapestry of time, especially EVs. And I arrived at this, the Enfield 8000. A British car, made, well, the concept of which came about in the late 1960s. Uh, the production car started in the early 70s when the oil crisis was about. Now, I'm here in the um, bubble car museum where it currently resides. And bubble cars were born out of fuel crises. That's kind of how they were, that, how they came about and mobilizing people from motorbikes and sidecars into cars. What fascinated me about this car, and this is a really important point, and I've brought his book, because bless him, he died actually quite recently, is the guy that designed this car and was intrinsic to this car was a bloke called John Aykroyd. I dedicate this car to John Aykroyd, really. This bloke here, there's Richard Noble, the man that drove Thrust 2, the world's fastest car for many, many years. Uh, one of the lead engineers on the project, John, did this before Thrust 2. And I bought his book and I chatted to him on the phone. I never met him. But there's this photo here. Can you see? When Thrust 2 finally got the land speed record, it came back and did a parade through London. And the escort car was an Enfield 8000. <laughs> this car actually was surprisingly good. Hand beaten aluminium body, uh, square section tube um, chassis, just like an Aston Martin of the 60s, the Superleggera idea, I kid you not. Um, rear wheel drive, and it, it passed with flying colours uh, safety, you know, crumples, crumple zones, impact zones, head on collisions at 30 miles an hour. And it was extremely aerodynamic. Those things ticked some boxes in my head. I thought, that's great. Now I need to find one. Easier said than done. It took me 18 months to find an Enfield 8000 to even think about starting building one. 
and I found this car, chassis number 003, um, from putting the word out on social media. Um, and someone called Nikki Gordon Bloomfield, who I will name check, um, who runs a really influential uh, YouTube channel and news portal for electric vehicles called Transport Evolved. I'll put a link up. She said to me, I know a friend of mine has got one of these and um, it's damaged. It's flood damaged, ironically, um, and they might sell it. They decided to sell it to me and then they changed their mind and then they changed their mind back again. And I eventually got my hands on it in February 2012. It had been restored in the 90s. Then it got flood damage when the River Severn, I think it was, uh, burst its banks and it was flooded up to about there. I've got a picture of it. And then it was electrically dead. It had also been featured, weirdly, as a booby prize in um, Britain's Worst Driver, presented and conceived by Quinton Wilson. So he had bought this car years before, and this exact car had been featured on Tomorrow's World in the very early 80s, um, which is a show I used to watch as a kid with fascination. So there was, th there was a number of factors here that attracted to me. The other thing is, the guy that set up and bankrolled the Enfield car company in the 60s and 70s, a chap called John Galandris. John Galandris was a, a shipping magnate. He was also a very forward-thinking bloke. Back then in the 60s, not many people were vegan and not many people practiced yoga. He did. He was a bit of a visionary and he saw the potential for an electric city car and that's why he invested in it. So how did all this start then? How do you get a car like this to go fast and not kill you? Well, that was my mission. After buying the car, I took it immediately on a trailer from Bristol, where I bought it, um, to Northamptonshire to Webster Race Engineering. John Webster's a well-known drag racer. And I put it under his nose and said, John, I've, I've got to get your opinion on this. Am I barking up a ridiculous tree? Can I make this car go quickly in a straight line? Um, safely, um, harnessing the kind of power that we would need. And all he said to me was, give me 15 minutes. And he walked around it when it was on the trailer with a pencil on his ear and a little notebook. And after 15 minutes of saying nothing, he just turned to me and he, he sort of tapped his chin and he went, I think this will work. And that was all I needed. The car went to him and the build started. So the strip down of the little Enfield began. Um, once the body was completely stripped and it had, had a cage, roll cage fitted in it, um, then while the drivetrain was being perfected, it went over to uh, my friend Tim Glover at Roadhouse Motor Co. And he did all of the body and paint on it. Like I said, this is an aluminium bodied car, um, all hand beaten, quite an expensive car for its time. It was two and a half times the price of a, a brand new Mini, which is why it wasn't massively uh, popular, so it was expensive. They only made 120 of them in the world, 60 of which were bought by the electricity board, as was called um, back then in the UK. And they used them, and this was one of those cars, they used them as a pool car for all the electricity boards around the UK to also run a program of what the viability of EVs would be and what the draw on the grid would be if more people started buying electric cars. So this was back in the very early 70s, early to mid 70s, and this is a 1974 car. It uses bits from existing cars in places. For example, the front suspension um, is from a Hillman Imp. There's parts from um, Mini. In fact, the, the doors are based on Mini doors, I believe, and the windows um, were m m modified from Minis. The door handles are from Hillman Avengers. The inside door handle are from um, Morris Marinas. There's lots of things. These headlights, Austin Allegro headlights. Um, there's lots of bits from other manufacturers. And yeah, all built on the Isle of Wight and then moved to a Greek island. So from one island to another island, it was always a bit of a contrived conception, this car but extremely aerodynamic. You only need to look at the windscreen to see how aero efficient it was. And that was always gonna be key if I'm trying to make something that's gonna be quick um, and fast and not crashy or dangerous. 
it's kind of emotional for me seeing this car now because I haven't seen it in quite a long time um, and I don't own the car anymore. It sits here and it's a, an exhibit, a static exhibit. I'll explain why I don't own it anymore in a bit. But if I look at the original specification of the Enfield 8000, so yeah, square section tube steel space frame, hand-built aluminium two-seater body, um, coil over McPherson strut front end, four link rear axle suspension. The rear axle is from a bond bug one of those orange things behind me, and it had eight horsepower, six kilowatt motor, 150 amps, 10 inch mini wheels, non-servo um, Hillman Imp drum brakes, um, a 40 mile an hour top speed. So naught to 60 was not a thing because it didn't do 60. Uh, it weighed 975 kilos, which was quite a lot actually. Over 300 kilos of those were lead acid batteries because back then lead acid technology was the norm. Of course, now we have lithium iron and that's what subsequently got put in the car. Really, this car helped to cement not just my interest in EVs, but I suppose my authority um, in the world of motoring journalism for electric vehicles. It got me featured on uh, the fully charged um, YouTube channel, which I subsequently spent three years working on with, with Robert Llewellyn. He was one of the first people to drive this car. Autocar came and drove it and did a feature on it because Autocar reviewed it when it was new in the early 70s. Um, and there's a quote that I'll show you. Autocar said, clearly with eight, only eight horsepower, the Enfield is no candidate for the drag strip. And I begged to differ, which is why I did what I did. Uh, and then they, then they ate their words. The motors are relatively easy to achieve on an EV and they're relatively cheap. Batteries are most expensive, hardest thing, especially when you're trying to get huge discharge of power in a short space of time and batteries that don't weigh a ton. The company Hyperdrive, I had a meeting with them back in 2011, uh, 2012. But Hyperdrive, a company up in Sunderland, they were quite a new outfit actually and they focused mostly on battery chemistry and battery technology and they were prepared to build the batteries um, uh, modules and the BMS the battery management system which is really crucial for sort of nannying all the cells inside their modules and making sure when they discharge and recharge they're balancing properly so each cell behaves itself because if you get a rogue cell especially with lithium-ion and the power that this car was putting out you could have yourself a few issues. So what you never wanted to do is to push them outside of their boundary of happiness. And that's why the charging and discharging um, process was had to be monitored closely. Okay, so here's the Enfield uh, flux capacitor with its additional battery pack uh, that now lives in the boot. Uh, I've just rigged up the charger and it's charging and balancing. So forget the electrical tape, that's just to insulate when I'm touching it. You see the flashing lights? They are the BMSs, the battery management systems, like the overlord of the system, if you like. Um, that is a 48 cell pack. It's like um, a quarter of the power of the car again. Here's the charger now here, making this noise. It's plugged in, in my garage, my untidy garage. And I've put the, uh, I've turned the lights off so you can see the the three main battery packs under here balancing with their flashing LEDs. There's 144 individual cells in here and then there's 48 cells in the boot and in total that gives you about uh, 400 volts and 2400 amps of current but the the system of the car, the sort of brain of the car will only cope with 2000 amps. It took nine months to source the correct spec of cells that we needed for this car to get the right weight, power output, aff affordability. And those cells were Kokum cells made in Korea. And they were, uh, what made this slightly complicated is they were military grade and you could only order them if you had a military account, which I didn't. <laughs> so a lot of negotiation went on. Hyperdrive ordered these, these cells for me they're pouch cells um, and we needed 144 of them um, in three modules which lived under here 
Normally you'd see those cells in a Bell Super Cobra military helicopter and they apparently ran the starter unit for the, um, the jet engines but also the Gatling miniguns on the side of it. Um, so they had to be quite light in order to be in a helicopter but they also had to be, have massive potency, perfect for an electric drag car. When they package them into the modules, they then put the BMSs in the top, and I'll show you footage of, of all of that. Um, and then we suddenly had ourselves a, a 300 volt um, car, which was capable of, of, of over 2000 amps of output. The 2015 season was pretty interesting, actually, because it got off to um, a positive start. We, th we thought we would take a while to get into the sort of 13, 12 second uh, quarter mile bracket, and actually, we managed to achieve that with relative ease. Uh, always with my mate Nick Farrow at my, at my side, who um, Nick was my crew chief, and actually, like I did, became so invested in the car, the amount of time it took to do this, I thoroughly underestimated it. It dominated my life for, for three or four years. Um, and that's time that money can't really buy in many ways, but I suppose I had this vision I had the consent from my wife, Chops, to, to just go for it. I had just enough sponsorship money to kind of make it work, and that's what we did. So the car, yes, it was repainted in um, a colour that was as close to one of the launch colours as possible. It, this is ochre yellow, um, it's a Lambretta colour. Um, Tim painted that on the car. Um, the windscreen of the Enfield 8000 is bespoke to the car which made it an absolute bugger to get hold of because um, although mine was in good condition originally, I broke it when I, um, I broke it trying to get the dashboard in one day, that dash unit, like a complete goon. So I needed to have one made and I got a company called Plastics for Performance up in Belmont, um, up north, to take the original one out, make a template and make another one and this is polycarbonate like all the others are it's heated polycarbonate they make windscreens for everyone like Koenigsegg Aston Martin loads of touring cars they were brilliant so that was a mission just in itself to get the screen sorted bumpers you can't buy the bumpers They're, they were bespoke to the car mine were rusty metal so I had a friend of mine who um, who builds beach buggies and molds beach buggies. I got him to make a master mold and these are lightweight glass fiber. All the little things, I became obsessed with it. Um, underneath the, the Hillman Imp front suspension was actually really good. A guy I know who lives a few miles from my house happens to be one of the UK's leading authorities on imps. So I got him to rebuild them and, and put um, better adjustable um, steering um, rods on them. We, we polybushed it. Um, my brother um, helped me do that. We had a bespoke braking system made because the wheels are so small, we needed the best braking system possible. So we got a company called uh, BG Developments to adapt a Caterham caliper and make a disc for this car uh, because it's non-servo. Um, we managed to get those on there. Bear in mind when it was new, it was a 10 inch wheel car, mini wheels. We managed to squeeze 12s on the front and 14s on the back. They look huge, but they're only 14s. And of course, because this was a street legal car, it had to always run on street tires as part of the series that I raced it in. I didn't want this car to turn into a kind of silhouette drag car, tubular chassis thing that wasn't really faithful to the original vehicle. So contrary to belief, this Enfield, it has the original floor pan and suspension up, up to about the back of these two seats. Beyond that, the floor pan was made bespoke because there's a back axle there that although it's still four linked um, adjustable, um, it's a four nine inch rear. We needed a significantly bigger axle to cope with the torque. And of course the transmission tunnel here had to be adapted because we were going from one eight horsepower motor to two motors that were capable of delivering some 800 horsepower. So there's a motor that goes into another motor with an input shaft and these are DC series wound motors. Old school tech in many ways but proven to cope with quite a lot of punishment. Uh, air cooled, fairly low tech. These were imported by um, 
Ollie at Current Racing. Uh, Ollie and his brother Sam were intrinsic to this build. They're probably the biggest pioneers of electric car drag racing in the UK, bar none, with their Black Current Beetle. They brought these motors in, modified the brushes and a couple of other tweaks. We had an input shaft machine, then there's a prop shaft that is that long that I had specially made. It's six inches long that goes from the back of this motor down here into the Ford 9 inch, the modified Ford 9 inch rear that Webster Race Engineering built. Webster did the cage, like I said, still got the original headlining, still got the original dash. I had to put race seats in it uh, with high backs and proper harnesses. That was mandatory really for my own safety, but also for racing in the series that I raced in. The series that I raced in is called Street Eliminator. I exclusively race the car at Santa Pod Raceway because they've got the best surface, um, the best drag strip in the country. And the great thing about the Street Eliminator series is it's hardcore. It's heads up racing. You have to do a mandatory 25 to 27 mile road cruise as part of the qualification process. And if you break down in that, you don't even qualify. So it proves the car's road legality. It has to be taxed, has to be MOT'd, has to run on street treaded tires, no slicks. And that immediately forces you to kind of keep the car legal. So when I, when I got the world record for quickest street legal EV, I knew people couldn't really quibble it. I knew that if the car had a tax and MOT uh, and street tires, that was it. The car has since been beaten, uh, but only just really. You got, you know, some tin pot bloke called Marte Rimac. Ready for launch. Ready. Who's done a few bits and bobs. Uh, you've got a few companies like Chevrolet and Ford building really quick cars, but it's taken quite a long time technologically to get near to this car. Um, the recipe seemed to work. Even from the early shakedowns when we, we, did a, we did a quick 16, then a 15, then we went straight into the 13s, then the 12s, loads of 11s. We did almost half a year of 10 second quarter miles, which was really quick. I, I never for a second thought this would go into the nines. But the winning, the magic ticket, the magic number was 986 at 131 miles an hour. So I needed to beat 10.24 seconds to beat the White Zombie, which was one of the most influential cars in this whole project. A chap called John Wayland in Portland, Oregon, with this Datsun uh, running ludicrous power and baiting all kinds of Corvettes and Vipers and other drag cars on the strip. And I just thought the story was wonderful. So John was one of my big inspirations here, but I wanted to try and beat that car. And ultimately we did. You know, the original Enfield, I've actually got, um, I've, I've got a few, um, I've got a, a, a brochure and, and things like that about it. The original Enfield was incredible. It had run flat tires. It had an onboard charging system. It had a heated windscreen. These were all things that hadn't been seen before really, especially in a car of this, of this dimension. Um, but I, 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 I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed driving it. So here we had a car that was like, suitable for 40 miles an hour and eight horsepower. And I'd taken it to 800-ish horsepower and 140 miles an hour. And yet it still felt fine. It still felt fine. It really became a car that I wore. I was very proud of it and I still am really proud of it. Um, every time I look at it, it gives me fantastic memories and 
Um, it's just comical, isn't it? Everyone loves an underdog. And I think that's what happened with this. It, gone, it went from being laughed at to suddenly people took it seriously because they saw what it was capable of. And it brought a smile to people's faces because I could stage this car up against quite a lot of powerful V8s, quite leery cars, 911 Turbo, I raced one of those. Um, and you know, give it, give it a good hiding. It's so hard to condense all the information from this car. And this was sort of early days of social media. I took a lot of pictures rather than video. Um, but I still have an active website for this car, thanks to Adrian Flux, which is flux-capacitor.co.uk. And I will put that in there. That was when I, I blogged all about the progress of the car, all about the highs and all about the lows. It's comical, isn't it? I mean, it is a micro car. It's a micro car. That, that time forgot about. And that's almost what drew me towards the Enfield 8000. I wanted to show people that electric cars are not a new idea. Um, electric can be charismatic, it can be thrilling, it can be interesting. Uh, and you can hot rod like we used to do decades and decades ago. It's still relevant now. And I think since building this car, more and more people have gone into that. More and more electric cars have been converted to EV. I think this scene's only going to rise. Would I do it again? I'd bloody love to do it again. It took a huge amount of energy. And I wanna say thank you so much to my wife, Chops, who stood by me for the years that I put this car together and ripped my hair out. Uh, actually, my hair did actually fall out um, <laughs> at the end of 2017. I never got it back. Um, the culmination of putting a project like this together is difficult unless you've got loads and loads of money and time. And I didn't have a lot of money and time. so. I want to say thank you to, to Ollie at Current Racing, uh, Hyperdrive, Nick Farrow at Gasset, who, my close friend, I couldn't have done it without you. Uh, we had so many hours of fun in the back of his camper van. Not like that, though. Um, I want to say thank you to, to Andrea, uh, Andriaki Shipping. I never finished the story about why I don't own it anymore. When I got the world record at 2016, I knew I couldn't afford to race it anymore. I decided to retire the car and work out what we were going to do next and do a few exhibitions with the car. My sponsor, Andriaki Shipping, the, the, the guy that owns Andriaki Shipping is the, um, is the relative of John Galandris, who I said bankrolled the entire operation of the Enfield car company. And he said, if you ever want to sell this car, uh, I'd be interested. And he was serious. So ultimately what happened was I decided to sell it. And he wants to put the car on static display. We have talked about getting the car back out again and dusting it off. Whether we will, I don't know. We'll see. I hope you enjoyed watching this episode. If you haven't already subscribed, subscribe to The Late Break Show and comment below. I'd love to know what you think. Thank you. Petrol, there's a thing. <laughs> <laughs>